welcome to virtual book signing once again. I'm Daniel Weinberg and we're at the Abraham Lincoln Bookshop as always here in Chicago. It's a gorgeous day. So we're very lucky to have two really wonderful authors here today. Uh, once again, we have uh, Earl Hess, who holds the Stuart McClellan Chair in, the history, uh, in history at Lincoln Memorial University in Harrogate, uh, which was named after Lincoln by O.L. Howard uh, uh, to, uh, to say thank you to the loyal Tennesseans who had stayed in the war. We'll talk about them as well. A noted Civil War lecturer and author, his previous books include Pickett's Charge, The Last Attack at Gettysburg, which was a Pulitzer Prize nominee, but did win the James I. Robertson Literary Prize. Also, Lee's Tar Heels, the Pettigrew Kirkland McCray Ray, uh, Brigade, that did win the Douglas Southall Freeman Award. His recent books, In the Trenches at Petersburg and The Rifle Musket in Civil War Combat, Reality and Myth. Uh, today's title is uh, Into the Crater, uh, The Mine Attack at Petersburg. University of South Carolina Press uh, publishes it. It's 344 pages, illustrations, and maps, and is 4495. Uh, with us as well today is Chris Hartley. Uh, his day job is working, working in marketing and communications, but a lifelong interest in history. A uh, frequent speaker on Civil War topics. He's the author also of Stewart's Tar Heels, a wonderful book that you might also want to uh, pick up and read. His latest book is Today's title, Stoneman's Raid, 1865. Uh, John F. Blair is the publisher, 512 pages, illustrations, and very useful maps, I've got to say, uh, at 2795. Uh, I think it's a definitive study of this raid, and I uh, hope uh, not your last book. It's an excellent narrative style. Um, as always, uh, we ask you to give us a quick and brief uh, summary of what brought you to these books? Uh, why did you decide to write on this particular subject now? Um, and I mean, there were certainly for the crater, uh, Earl, there were other books already. What were their shortcomings uh, that you were able to address in this one? Oh, that, that's an interesting question, Dan. I, I, I actually so. started. I actually started the research on this book in 1999, long before those books that you, you mentioned came out, and it, I wanted to do it. Close, as close to a definitive job of researching this project as I possibly could, went to something like 50, 60 archives to find material. It, as I say in the preface, it was an exhaustive and oftentimes exhausting process of doing research for it. By the time I finally got it all together and started writing it, two or three other books began to pop up in the woodwork on the, on the Battle of the Crater. Who can blame authors for doing that? It's a perennial topic of interest for everybody. The most famous battle of the Petersburg campaign and the most famous mine attack in American military history where a mine more than 500 feet long, an underground tunnel was dug and 8,000 pounds of powder blew up a salient in the Confederate line at Petersburg. But the resulting Union attack that followed up, poorly coordinated, many mistakes made, a complete disaster. Grant said it was the saddest affair he had ever witnessed in the Civil War, 4,000 Union casualties and nothing to show for it. That human drama was what drove me to the Battle of the Crater. And understanding how attacks are conducted, understanding why they fail, why they succeed, it's a classic case study and all of that stuff. By the time this book came out, three or four other books had come out also, and if I had to say what distinguishes them, this one is more definitive in terms of its research and its coverage. I, I cover every angle of the battle of the crater. I offer new perspectives on certain key aspects of that battle some things that may be a little different than most people uh, think happened in there. And of course, a wonderful topic, who's to blame for it? Well, I try to address that question also, and it was, it was a great deal of fun, and I'm glad to see it finally come out. Well, Chris, uh, yours also is a very famous uh, event in Civil War history, uh, but again, what brought you to uh, this particular uh, raid? Yeah, thanks, Dan. Great to be here. Um, you know, I, I would probably call attention to, to two events in, in my lifetime. So, growing up in North Carolina, one thing that's, that's pretty ubiquitous are the number of historical markers that surround the landscape uh, that, that commemorate Stoneman's Raid. Yet, there's not much information out there about Stoneman's Raid. There's one slim volume uh, that's available, which is not even available anymore, it's really out of print today. Um, so, the question that has always popped into my mind, what, what, is, what really happened in this raid? Um, 
So it, my process began uh, trying to figure that out with the second event, which when I was a student at the University of North Carolina, um, I finally decided to do a paper on this topic. And began the investigation uh, on that, that topic. Did not get an A for the paper, um, but uh, hopefully I've got it today. I, I still talk to my professor and know him well about that. Um, well, there's some books so, already sold, so that's your name. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Um, and, but, you know, and really be, from there, it was kind of the launching pad to continue the investigation on this, uh, this topic. Uh, it's been a fascinating topic because um, despite the fact there are so few, um, there's so little information out there about these historical markers, um, it's, it's an amazing raid because it was um, perhaps the longest raid in American military history, well over a thousand, nearly two thousand miles for some of the men on the raid. Uh, it involved a lot of the uh, quote unquote luminaries of uh, the Civil War, uh, people like uh, Robert E. Lee, Joseph E. Johnston, PGT Beauregard, George Thomas, Ulysses S. Grant, William T. Sherman, soldiers of that nature, even Miles Keough, the, the famous soldier who goes on to die to, with Custer at Little Bighorn, make appearances in this story. Uh, and all of them uh, participate to a level that is just a fascinating story from, from beginning to end, uh, plus the fact it's just a long way to ride on a horse. Yes, it is. And they had trouble getting horses. Uh, I'm amazed that they were able to continue to obtain horses. Uh, that was, certainly that was one of the reasons that it was delayed, as we see in your book, that and the uh, need for carbines, which uh, didn't show up in a timely fashion. It, it was a tremendous issue. Um, uh, George Stoneman was partnered with, uh, with George Thomas in, in getting this raid ready to go. George Thomas, of course, is known for his slowness um, throughout Civil War history, and uh, some people might suggest that that has, has something to do with it, but really the competition for horses and weapons had, had even more to do with that um, because you had other raiders like uh, James Wilson's troopers who were about to, to launch an, an attack in the Deep South. All these folks were competing for resources at the moment. So. The raid was delayed, and on top of that, you had difficult weather in that spring, late winter, early spring of 1865 that delayed it even further. But they were able to obtain horses on the raid over those 2,000 plus miles? Uh, they were. Um, it was a story of um, get a horse, trade a horse throughout mm -hmm. the entire raid. All right. um, so you wear one out, you go to uh, the local house and trade it for another horse. Well, I'm going to keep on this for a moment. Uh, you, you say that in the book that... Stallman's raid was a tactical success. Mm -hmm. uh, what was it, its objective, mm -hmm. and did it did it attain that? Mm -hmm. uh, its objective overall was to really help end the Civil War uh, at its simplest. Uh, so uh, which it's kind of interesting with uh, with Earl's book. So the idea was with the armies entrenched at Petersburg, uh, it was a raid of insurance in many ways. So if for some uh, unknown way the the Confederate armies were able to get away from Petersburg or if Joseph E. Johnson's army were able to escape from where it was at the moment, you know, around central North Carolina, there's only one place they could have gone, and that was to western North Carolina and southwestern Virginia. And Stoneman's job was to eliminate the resources they would have needed to continue that uh, the war. And Stoneman did it very well, but it wasn't needed. Um, obviously, Ultimately, but they, they didn't, didn't know that then. Right. Uh, same with the, the crater. Uh, what was the <clears throat> objective there? Uh, explain to everyone that, who doesn't know uh, about the crater, and kind of briefly, what was the objective, and did it help end the war? Oh, well, good question. And <laughs> the objective is very simple. Crack opened the Confederate fortified line at Petersburg. The Petersburg campaign began in mid-June, June 15th, 1864. The federal problem here was trying to root the, the Army of Northern Virginia out of those heavily fortified positions. Uh, Colonel Hen Lieutenant Colonel Henry Pleasants of the 48th Pennsylvania thought he had an idea. He saw the, the, the point where no man's land was the most narrow, 125 yards of sandy soil, separated a Confederate uh, salient from the most forward Union line. And Pleasance, who was a coal mining engineer from the pre-Civil War period, thought we can dig an underground tunnel under that no man's land space. It's not too far. We can blow up the uh, a section of the Confederate line as long as the infantry commanders organize an, an adequate attack to follow through right afterward, they can break open, slice through the Confederate line like a hot knife slicing through butter, crack open the position, capture Petersburg, maybe capture Richmond, maybe destroy Lee's army, etc., etc. It could have been, possibly, a war-winning move on the part of the Federals if everything had worked out okay. But of course, as I think everybody probably knows, it didn't work out that way. And the question of why it was such an utter failure on a tactical level is one of the more fascinating stories to tell about this battle. Um, 
Each of them, of course, elicited a Confederate response. We're not almost there yet in the story, but uh, it's in my mind. Uh, so what, each of you, what was the Confederate response? And Omaha uh, came in, did he, did he save Petersburg at that moment? Uh, well, he, he would like everybody. About, uh, and Chris will get to you too, what the mm -hmm. Confederate response was. M Mahone wanted to make sure everybody thought he saved Petersburg, of oh. course. <laughs> uh, and, and the answer is yes and no. What happened was that the, the mine exploded, it devastated the South Carolina Brigade, commanded by Stephen Elliott, that held that sector of the line. What was left of that South Carolina Brigade actually did a pretty good job of acting on the defensive to contain the Union, pen the union breach. More important than that was a breakdown of understanding and command and control on the part of the federal troops who were involved, and they were, were lodged in that breach, breach from 5 o'clock to 9 o'clock the, on the morning of July 30th, 1864. The South Carolinians didn't have enough strength to counterattack and kick them out, so Lee had to bring in reinforcements. Uh, Mahone's division on the far Confederate right provided those reinforcements, and General uh, William Mahone, a scrappy little Gosh, I think it was five feet one or something like that, very short, very skinny, but very aggressive commander who was rising up to his level of fame in the Civil War in this time period, uh, personally directed uh, the placement of troops and his old the brigade led the counterattack at nine o'clock. Now one of the things I point out in, in the book is that after the, the war is over, Mahone went to great lengths to make sure that everybody thought that his people turned the tide, and to a degree they did, but he fails to point out that the, North Carolina, the South Carolinians did an awful lot to help him to prepare the way. He failed to point out that there were North Carolina troops also who participated with his brigade's attack at 9 o'clock and was assiduous in attacking anybody after the war who tried to share any of the glory with them. Nevertheless, even though that may sound a little uh, unsavory on Mahone's part, the truth is that his counterattack did completely turn the tide of the Battle of the Crater on July 30th and allowed the Confederates to seal the breach and save the line that day. Chris? So as uh, Stoneman's Raiders uh, began their raid, the, the Confederate response was one uh, of reluctance in many ways. Uh, clearly Robert E. Lee had his hands full uh, at Petersburg and Joseph Johnson had his hands full. There just weren't many troops, there weren't many uh, resources available. Um, Beauregard was the guy who, who the problem fell to. And he basically told, uh, told his commanders, you know, gee, I really don't want this job. I don't have the resources to handle it, but I'll do it. Uh, to his credit, he was able to, uh, to gather enough forces at key locations throughout North Carolina, grab troops as they came through, troops from the, the, the former Army of, the Tennis, of Tennessee as they were making their way to Johnston, uh, grab any forces, home guardsmen, wherever he could find them, and managed to erect some decent-sized defenses uh, along key points, mainly along the North Carolina Railroad through central North Carolina. Problem was, George Stoneman zigged uh, when they thought he was going to zag. So he took a left turn and headed up into Virginia. Um, Beauregard figured, well, okay, he's gone. We're done. We're moving on. Those troops dispersed, and Stoneman turned around and came back. What was he zigging to or zagging to? Well, his, his first zag was to head to southwestern Virginia and the railroad lines that were uh, headed through that area, mm -hmm. uh, the East Tennessee and Virginia Railroad, one of the key resources that were targeted. Um, he moved into that area and his troopers were able to make short work of that railroad, uh, ruining over 150 miles of that, uh, that railroad line, uh, destroying quite a number of supplies, um, um, bridges and so forth, uh, very successfully. And at that point, once they completed southwestern Virginia, which was the primary objective, they headed south to tackle more rail railroad resources in North Carolina. The Salisbury Prison was another one that was a... Uh is that just they come upon, came upon it, or did they actually want to go to it? You know, that was always in the back of George Stoneman's mind. Uh, George Stoneman, uh, and I'm sure many of you know, uh, was captured in 1864 during the Atlanta campaign while attempting to uh, to capture another prison and and uh, free the federal soldiers at Andersonville. Uh, he himself got captured along the way, and uh, in the process sat down on a log and cried uh, at that moment, mm -hmm. becoming the highest ranking federal general in Confederate hands. Later exchanged, he was looking for a way to exonerate himself, and this prison seemed like the perfect opportunity uh, down in Salisbury. Uh, I'm going to put something up right now because I have two other questions I want to talk about, and one of them involves Meade. Uh, what did Meade think about, uh, here he is with his staff uh, in a beautiful albumin photograph of the day. You know we can do this here at the Abraham Lincoln Bookshop because uh, we have these things. Uh, in our stock for uh, for sale as well. If you happen to love this, you can always call us. Uh, but Meade, what was his thoughts on on this whole affair? 
it, he's a controversial figure in the crater battle because there's a tendency he's an engineer. for he gosh i think he was an engineer yeah. before the civil war uh at, at this point as commander of the army of the potomac he had of course to concern himself with bigger issues than that but he, yeah yeah exactly uh, he tends to be something of a whipping boy, I think, by a lot of commentators who blame him for everything that happened on July 30th because at the last minute he told his Corps commander, 9th Corps commander Ambrose Burnside, who was in charge of prepping the attack, he told him to change a very key aspect of it. You can't lead the attack tomorrow with your black division, which is what was really the cornerstone of Burnside's attack plan uh, for the, after the mine was, was exploded. So Burnside went through a great deal of last-minute alterations in his plan to try to make up for that. So, and they blame me for not giving uh, Burnside as much gunpowder as he wanted to blow up the mine. They blame him for several other things. My argument runs a bit counter to that. I, I generally give me good marks for many different reasons. I, 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 first of all, I think that the powder thing, Burnside was asking like something like 12,000 pounds of powder. The professional engineers with the Army of the Potomac said that's too much, it's unnecessary, it's not going to achieve anything more than you can do with 8,000 pounds, so that's what they gave him. Uh, they, you, you also, I think, can't really come down too hard on George Meade for changing the attack plan. The Black Division was fresh, but at the same time it had no combat experience. And Meade didn't want to lead with, with troops like that, and Grant supported him. And I guess when, another way to put it is that Meade is Burnside's superior. If he has a good reason for anything to say that you should change things, the subordinate drops to say, yes, sir, and do it properly. And Burnside did not do it properly. He really made a bollocks of it and made some bad mistakes in reorganizing the plan, that they, which he should not have made. So in other words, the point is I generally come down more heavily on Burnside than on Meade in this situation. The, re the, the reality is when Meade first, first learned about the, uh, the, the digging of the mine, he was enthusiastic about it. He never thought that it would be a failure. He thought that technically it's, it's doable. He just didn't think that it was not necessarily the best place to launch an infantry attack because it was a shallow angle in the Confederate line, not sharp enough to allow for good success. And there was a ridge 500 yards behind that angle in the line that was higher ground. The Confederates could just retreat there and you still don't have a breakthrough possibly. So me was unenthusiastic about the great prospects of success after the, the mine exploded, but he had no problem with the mine itself. He thought it was a good idea. And, and his engineers also thought it was a good idea. Contrary to what Colonel Pleasant said after the war, the professional regular army engineers in the Army of the Potomac were impressed by his mind and thought he was doing a wonderful job. Pleasance, for his own reasons, after the war, tried to argue that I did it alone against the advice of these West Pointers who didn't know what they were doing. Because my experience was practical and I knew it would work and they didn't know anything like I did. So Pleasance is a, is a controversial character who tried deliberately to paint Meade and other people as being uncooperative and trying to put roadblocks in front of his projects, and it really isn't true. How about Grant? I mean, this is part of his... Uh, no, I'm not going to talk about Grant later on. Um, yeah, I'm going... I'm sorry, I'm going elsewhere. I had too many things I wanted to say. One of them I wanted to ask about, though, uh, Chris, is that uh, we're going to have James Swanson coming in mm -hmm. uh, with his bloody crimes in a couple of weeks mm -hmm. or a few weeks, and that is covers the chase for Jefferson Davis. Yeah. One of the objectives was the chase for Jefferson Davis for Stoneman, wasn't it? And wasn't there mm -hmm. kind of a, a couple of different groups trying to get there first and get the reward? There were. So ultimately, as the, as the war wound down and uh, the surrenders took place. The, the objective of this, uh, this raiding force changed. They were, they were deep in the mountains of North Carolina and received orders to pursue Jefferson Davis to the end of the earth. Um, they immediately turned about. Uh, many of the troopers at the time were hoping it was time to go home, but nonetheless they had to receive these various uh, different orders and, uh, and the chase began. Uh, when this chase began, Jefferson Davis was essentially ahead of them to the south, uh, or uh, I guess more specifically to the southwest. James Wilson's troopers, uh, which had been raiding down into Mississippi and Alabama, uh, was, was ahead of Jefferson Davis. So as it was described later, uh, when, uh, when Wilson's troopers later captured uh, Jefferson Davis uh, in, I uh, believe it was May 10th in Irwinville, Georgia, uh, it, as it was described, uh, Stoneman's raiders were almost like the hounds chasing the rabbit. They were chasing uh, Jefferson Davis into the bag itself that, uh, that James Wilson held. And we're given a lot of credit for that. Mm -hmm. uh, and in fact, along the way, had a number of opportunities to actually capture uh, Jefferson Davis, uh, including one event in Greensboro uh, 
um, where Jefferson Davis uh, crossed over a railroad bridge the same day that Stoneman's Raiders destroyed it uh, later that day. Uh, when he was later told of that, Davis said, a miss is as good as a mile. Yeah, yeah well, uh, Judy Benjamin would say the same thing down in Florida where he was uh, with some, uh, some woman in her plantation and he was out the back door and they were in the front door one morning. So it happened uh, quite a bit. Um, <clears throat> There was, a, for the crater, there was a lot of, uh, uh, later on, there was a lot of worry about the racial motivations uh, that took place. Uh, Ferrero's uh, black troops were used in there, and of course, as most know about the, the uh, crater, they were in the crater and they couldn't get out, and they were mowed down by uh, Mahone and his troops. Uh, were they racially motivated killings when, when it came down to that? Were the emotions up there? And uh, how is this, uh, this ra ugly racial aspect seen today at Petersburg National Battlefield Park? Okay, some nice questions. Yeah, this black division commanded by General Edward Ferrero, uh, which was one of the divisions of the Ninth Corps, was actually used. They didn't lead the attack but it was the last federal troops to go into the breach. And they actually attacked with vigor, with enthusiasm. In many ways, they made more strenuous efforts to break out of the breach than the white troops did. I give them credit for that. But then, while in the process of trying to do that, Mahone's brigade counterattacked, and it was just like everything completely altered in a second. There was a mass panic on the part of the blacks, and that's, that's clearly documented in, in the, uh, the material. Not all blacks ran but several hundred of the black troops did lose their nerve and did retreat in a panic back to the Union lines, disrupted some Union white formations that were trying to advance also, took a lot of white soldiers with them. So it was a big turning point in the battle that completely altered the scenario and the balance that was going on there. Had Ferrell's troops been trained for this by chance? Well, this is an interesting question. From the time, you know, it took about a month to dig this mine from late June to late July. During the course of that, Burnside is assiduously planning, according to his scenario, to lead with the black troops. He and some other officers argue that they gave special training to the black units to, as to exactly what they should do when they hit the breach, how to work that, and gave special instructions about moving. Some officers in the black regiments, however, said, no, nothing special was told us. But other, other white officers in those, those black units said, yes, we did have special training. So the, the, the jury is a bit out on that issue, I guess. You can find evidence on both sides. Uh, in the end, it didn't matter because, because they were the last division to go in. They just had to go into the breach and try to break out of it. And what happened was a lot of black troops did stay in the trenches and did fight. The Confederate survivors of the Battle of the Crater in Mahone's division wrote many, many accounts about fighting, hand-to-hand -hand fighting with black troops. Your question about what is the racial aspect is no doubt at all that there was a massacre of black troops in the Battle of the Crater. A lot of them were killed in cold blood by Mahone's, Mahone's brigade. The Confederates were not shy about this. They, they, in some cases, literally bragged about it. And they did so right after the war, right during the battle in 64 in the in after action letters home. They talked about it 40 years later when they wrote recollections of the battle. They were not shy about saying that we were enraged to see a black man in a blue uniform with a gun in his hand. It was the first time that Lee's army saw that in the Civil War. And uh, there's a historian named Kevin Levin who is arguing very persuasively that the result is very similar to what you saw with Nat Turner's rebellion in 1831 in Virginia, that the kind of, the, the, the idea of an of a ex-slave with a weapon in his hand triggers something in Southern minds uh, to the point where they're willing to do anything necessary to put it down. So in, in, in white Southern minds, it's justified to kill them, even, if, even after they surrendered, for the most part. Uh, so there's no doubt that several hundred black troops were killed in the Battle of the Crater, many of them legitimately in, in the course of armed hand-to-hand -hand combat, but an awful lot of them, we don't know exactly how many, were killed in cold blood after they gave up and tried to surrender. Another interesting thing that I found in the literature, too, is that once disarmed, once under the power of the Confederates, some of these black soldiers, some of whom were ex-slaves, uh, tried to ingratiate themselves with their Confederate captors and say, no, I didn't mean to join the, the Yankee army. They forced me to do it. I'm, I'm a good guy. I won't, I'll, I'll be your servant from now on if you spare my life. It's a somewhat pathetic sort of uh, but understandable reaction 
once they're in the power of the enemy to try to save themselves. And it, it, it adds to the human tragedy, I think, of the crater when you look at it from that perspective. Was there any reaction from the white soldier on the Union side to seeing that happen? Some white soldiers who saw this happen carried that image with them for the rest of their lives and wrote in their memoirs afterward how sickening it made them to see that. There is some evidence, however, that white officers in black regiments went the opposite direction and when they saw what was happening, they themselves killed black soldiers so that the Confederates would see them doing that and not kill them. There are two or three ev cases of evidence of that happening, which is, I think, a kind of an interesting and somewhat bizarre reaction to, this, to the circumstance. It just shows that human nature is varied. Was they that, react in was different that, ways. Where was that written down? Uh, where did you find okay, that? It's, it's, it's in Union accounts. Uh, you, you white officers of black regiments who survived the battle, who write after the war and say, I saw this happen. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And some Confederate soldiers who said they saw that happen also. And it's not a lot. It may have happened two or three cases, but it wasn't widespread or anything like that. But it's interesting that you see any evidence of that at all. Well, I was able to take out an artifact from my own library, uh, and it is a rec the first recording of the band uh, with uh, the night they drove Old Dixie down, which is, uh, is in your book. and. Uh, is tied to the raid, the Stoneman's Raid. Um, first of all, please explain that. How, how did that come about? It is. so. In 19, is it accurate? Yeah, it, it, to some degree. Uh, so in 1969, the band released this album, uh, which included the song The Night They Drove Old Dixie Down, uh, in which uh, there's a, a, a rebel by the name of Virgil Kane who's having a lot of problems. And he blames Stoneman's Raiders for the problems he experiences as the war wanes. Um, so the question that I wrestled with throughout this, uh, this book was, did Stoneman's Raid truly drive Old Dixie down? Um, my conclusion was yes and no. Uh, the no was on the military side. Uh, militarily, Stoneman's troopers set out to help end the Civil War, uh, and while they did yeoman service at the end, in the final analysis, uh, what they did did not really uh, have a lot of effect on the end of the, this, the Civil War from a military perspective. Um, the civilians in the path of Stoneman's Raiders would have had a different answer. Uh, they underwent uh, a number of, of losses, a number of difficult situations in, in giving up um, food and giving up um, horses and giving up um, you know, fence rails, uh, goods of that nature, to this force that did not have a supply line and, and had to take it from the land. Um, that ultimately affected the ability of the Southerners to uh, to bounce back during the Reconstruction period because it just simply made it harder for them and, and drove old Dixie. I want to get into this a little bit because I so. kind of got, as you say, yes and no. I got two different mm -hmm. aspects of that. Mm -hmm. That you say that Reconstruction did hamper, mm -hmm. uh, it was was hampered by the effects of the raid. Mm -hmm. Yet at the same time, you did say that some, with certain civilians. I'm not sure how, what proportion you put. Mm -hmm. uh, the treatment of the civilians contributed to sectional healing. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. uh, it, it, get, it got me a little confused onto that. that. And that's a great point. So uh, I guess, um, you know, it's, it's a one way of looking at that is Stoneman's Raiders could have behaved a whole lot worse toward the civilians. And, and here's a great example. So uh, a standard operating procedure when George Stoneman led, uh, led a cavalry raid during the Chancellorsville campaign, anytime he would have a horse that would be worn out, he would shoot that horse. He would kill it on the spot. The idea, of course, you kill the horse, the Confederates would not be able to utilize that resource again. Uh, during Stoneman's raid, it was completely the opposite. They simply traded, and I think we mentioned this before, as a horse became played out, they would trade that horse in and leave that horse uh, for the locals and walk away with their own horse. Um, what they did take away, of course, were the foodstuffs and damaged the infrastructure, uh, damaged uh, telegraph lines, uh, mail service ended, schools closed, money crashed. Uh, you had all kinds of things that happened as a result of their passing, uh, but the way they behaved toward the locals, there were certainly some exceptions, but the, the way they behaved toward the locals did help sectional healing in some ways because they were able to get a start with a lot of horses named Old Stoneman in the years after the war. Yes. <laughs> Now, uh, back to Grant, uh, because this, the crater was part of his third offensive. Mm -hmm. Maybe very briefly just mention, uh, describe what that was and how did the crater fit into that as far as Grant was concerned? You know, well, Grant's concern was to try to jumpstart the Union offensive movements at Petersburg after the first failure in mid-June and a very short little uh, second offensive. 
Grant spent about a month trying to figure this out, and he knew that Pleasance was digging this mine. He knew he could incorporate that mine into his third offensive if he wanted to, and he came up with a plan. His plan for the third offensive is, is a two-track process. Move troops north of the James River to try to strike at uh, what he thought was fairly weak Confederate defenses north of the James River in, in some fortified positions. Possibly send Sheridan's, Phil Sheridan's cavalry on a raid to cut rail lines uh, into uh, Richmond from the north. And if possibly, you know, Sheridan might be able to get into Richmond, capture the Confederate capital perhaps, along with uh, the Second Corps of the Army of the Potomac under Winfield Scott Hancock. And if all of that failed to work, then there's always Burnside in his mind. You can give him orders to uh, prep the mine, explode it, do his attack plan. And it's a two for one punch here. If one punch doesn't work, you have another option to do that. So Grant, I, I think the, th the third offensive at Petersburg is Grant at his best as a military planner because he, he liked options. He liked to have two or three different ro roads he could go depending on what happens at any given moment of that offensive. So his heart was in this? He, he felt it was a good plan if circumstances allowed him to continue on with it? He, he, he thought it was a good plan. He thought it was workable. I, I, he doesn't say an awful lot in the pre-attack phase about the details of what he thought about the operation. But my impression is he kind of agreed with Meade. It's not the best place to attack. In fact, Meade and Grant both seem to have thought that if worse comes to worse, you could just detonate the, the mine, scare the Confederates, kill a few hundred Confederate troops, but not even attack afterward. Yeah. That's, that was a feasible possibility. Grant had done that with the second mine explosion at the third Louisiana Redan in the Vicksburg siege, for example. Um, but it was only, it was relatively late in the planning process, like the night of July 29th, that Burnside got the final, final word, yes, go in and go in full square and do everything. Until that point, Grant was holding open the possibility of doing a, a, a number of different things. I think Grant expected a lot from this attack, and he, I don't think he's, he's fudging it in his memoirs when he said it was the saddest affair of the war and one of the best prospects for winning something big that we had but which was uh, fouled up. Hmm. Um, what does the crater look like today for those who want to go down and see it? We know that the Stonemans, there are many markers to go, and there must mm -hmm. be a good map for that in the book uh, to show <laughs> where they are. But uh, uh, what, what is left of the crater today? Well, it's, a, it's an interesting question. For Stoneman's raid, that's a mobile campaign that goes all over the place. With the crater, it was a very small little battlefield. The breach in the Confederate line was, I think, maybe 500 yards long, and that's about it. Something like 10,000 Union troops were jammed into a section of Confederate earthworks 500 yards north and south, and maybe 100 yards east and west. It's a small battlefield. The crater itself is a big hole, about, uh, what was it, uh, something like 30 feet deep if I remember correctly, about 30 feet, 25, 30 feet deep, about 60, 70, 100 feet long. I forget the exact dimension, sorry. But it was a gigantic hole, a gaping hole. It began, by the way, it was also the burial place of a couple hundred uh, Union soldiers also. When the Confederates recaptured the crater, they just buried everybody they could in the bottom of it and began to shuffle in the sides. And, but it was a fighting platform for the rest of the Petersburg campaign for the Confederates nevertheless. Uh, they had to endure the smell and all the uncomfort, everything, of manning the crater, which was literally a burial place for, for fallen soldiers. You, you talk about that in the book, how yeah. the, the after effects on yeah. the olfactory right. <laughs> was yeah. not good. Uh, today, if you want to go to Petersburg, it's, I think it's probably the most heavily visited part of the Petersburg National Battlefield. It, you may look at it today and think, that doesn't look like what I read in Dr. Hess's book, perhaps, but that's because time, of course, has eroded. It's a much more uh, modest hole in the ground today. But with a little imagination, you can kind of take your mind back to it and, and think about what it was like there on July 30th, 1864. Hmm. Uh, maybe we need some small rama first the yeah. dust and the <laughs> explosion and, and then the after effects. <laughs> I, it was interesting to note, I, I had forgotten this, that uh, the salient when salient was where the Hampton Roads Peace Commissioners went through. Across the line. Across right. the line, yeah. right there. Yeah. yeah. A, lo a lot happened at that salient, didn't it? Yeah. yeah. It did indeed. It was called Elliott Salient after Elliott's South Carolina Brigade or Pegram Salient after P uh, Richard Pegram's Virginia Battery, which manned that, that position, which was almost wiped out by the explosion. And there were some trench raiding taking place there in late 64 and early 65, too. So it was a, it was a place where a lot happened. 
Chris, uh, I, I'm showing here uh, the uh, 15th Pennsylvania Cavalry, Column South, uh, one of the uh, regiments that was along with Stoneman, uh, as were others. These are Pennsylvanians, and I'd like you to mm -hmm. maybe talk a little bit about, uh, I think this book you said uh, beforehand was important for your study. Mm -hmm. And also, uh, after that, to talk about the Tennesseans mm -hmm. that were in the war, because uh, the 13th Tennessee, a Union, uh, regiment, what role did they play in the force and uh, how did they treat their neighbors? They came from that area. Were they rougher on them uh, or not? Is, is there evidence of that? Mm -hmm. Tell us about 15th Pennsylvania as well. Yeah, Stillman's Cavalry included uh, three brigades, the Cavalry Division of the District of East Tennessee and of those three brigades, the, the first brigade and, and best brigade was uh, that commanded by William J. Palmer who founded the 15th Pennsylvania Cavalry uh, that the book, um, the Column South, is about. Uh, this book was uh, one of several I consulted for uh, for learning more about the 15th uh, Cavalry's exploits. And the 15th Pennsylvania Cavalry was indeed the best regiment on the raid. Uh, a lot of really good uh, personal letters, uh, personal anecdotes from a couple of uh, brothers on the raid, the Coltons. Uh, so a very helpful resource that I used throughout my research on Stoneman's raid and learning more about the 15th Pennsylvania Cavalry. Um, to address your other questions, some of the other uh, units on the raid uh, had uh, titles such as uh, Michigan Cavalry Regiments uh, or Ohio Cavalry Regiments, as well as you had a couple of Tennessee Cavalry Regiments. Uh, the unique thing about them is that a number of them uh, regiments contain troops from Tennessee, from North Carolina, from Virginia. Uh, the 12th Michigan Cavalry is a good example of that. If you go through their roster, you will see North Carolina, North Carolina, Virginia, and so forth. These, of course, are men who have gone over Union lines to join and serve the Union. Uh, many of them are disgruntled. Many of them were not very happy with the way they were treated uh, by their neighbors during the Civil War. Um, some called it persecution um, in, their, uh, in, in their memoirs, and this is their chance for retribution. And there is a little bit of that uh, throughout. Uh, home Yankees is the way many of them were referred to by Southerners throughout the raid. Uh, as a matter of fact, one of Stoneman's commanders, his second in command, Alvin Gillum, uh, was a home Yankee himself. Born in Tennessee, his father was from North Carolina, and General Gillum uh, felt that uh, his family, uh, and including his wife, had been uh, harassed to some degree by Southerners and uh, probably enjoyed this suffering um, a little bit more than some of the other troops on the raid. Yes, I'm going to put you to work here doing some signing since many of those watching have uh, asked for these books, both of you, and, uh, and uh, I'm going to just mention a few of the names of people who have uh, helped us by uh, ordering a book and allowing the publishers to bring fine authors like this to us because we're able to uh, sell their books and we appreciate your support. Uh, Dog in Louisville, the Smith family as always in Longwood, Florida. Jerry in Clark Summit, Pennsylvania. Bruce in Nutley, New Jersey. Thank you, Bruce. John in Evanston. Come on down next time and say hello. Uh, Bryn in Covington, Georgia. One of our stalwarts. Thank you for that. Uh, Bruce in State College, uh, Pennsylvania. And Michael in Norman, Oklahoma. Uh, Bill in San Francisco. Mike in Lynchburg, Virginia. Uh, Don in Aurora, uh, Colorado. Thank you again. Uh, Stephen in South Haven, Michigan, Rich in Green Bay, Wisconsin, Gerald in Rochester, there are many others of you too, uh, but we want to continue on with this uh, discussion. Um, Earl, I want to ask you, uh, what was it like to cross that no man's land uh, after the explosion? And, you know, you ask a number of questions in your preface that you want to answer and what you do. Uh, were the Federals paralyzed by the explosion and seeing body parts flying all over the place and everything else? Uh, what, what was it like right at that moment before and as they had to go through? And what was happening in the background with Ledley? Was he really drinking oh, back then? Okay, good. Good questions, Dan. Uh, yeah. I only have good questions. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, 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 I was fascinated in the research here that so many people saw the mine explosion and so many people described it. It was a magnificent sight to them. To see 8,000 pounds of powder lift how many tons of dirt up into the air. And I do actually devote an entire chapter in the book to the mine explosion itself. Much of that is devoted to the descriptions that Union and Confederate soldiers wrote about what it was like to see it go up into the air. 
and they the, the it was an awe-inspiring thing if you were very close to it it was frightening uh, the, the the Union soldiers of Ledley's division James Ledley's division a white division of the ninth corps they were the closest to it 125 yards away from it they weren't expecting it nobody really told them what you can expect to see so it was startling to them so much so especially when some of the debris began to descend from the mushroom cloud and begin to fall on them and pelt them they actually there was a reaction by those forward Union troops to go back a little bit even before they began to attack until the officers got control of them and put them back in their place again as a result it was about 15 minutes after the mine went up that the first Union troops went into the breach the farther away you were, the more you had nerve you had, and it was an awe-inspiring thing. Some Union troops a mile away, two miles away saw it, and they said just nice things about it. It was like some sort of artistic creation there on the landscape, and it was a beautifully clear, bright morning on July 30th, so they had great views of it. Um, the idea that when Union soldiers got into the breach, they were struck all to the point where they couldn't do anything, I don't think is real. I didn't find any evidence of that in, in the primary material. The, the survivors of the crater did not say that. Basically what it was, Burnside in the instructions to his uh, division commanders the night before apparently made a mistake and Ledley, who led Ledley's division, led the division, uh, led the attack, and Ledley apparently told his subordinates that all you have to do is go into the breach and stay there. So that's what they did. And instead, they were supposed to, of course, branch out of it and try to continue counterattacking up to the ridge 500 yards on the other side. But nobody thought that was their job, so they didn't try to do that. The other divisions behind Ledley came in there, and they just added manpower and packed manpower into that small space of ground without doing anything about it. So my argument is that the crater did not psychologically shock Union troops into inactivity. Now, James Ledley, there's obviously no doubt that he, he, he has the odds-on favorite for the award of being the worst division commander in the whole Civil War in either army. It's a sad case because he really was utterly inept to start with. On top of that, he had a bad case of malarial poisoning from his North Carolina experience and was drinking whiskey for the past year or two before July 30th, 1864 to counterattack the, uh, the chills and everything, and it got out of hand. He was a drunkard. And he was drunk in the Battle of, Cold, uh, Battle of North Anna in late May of 1864 during the Overland Campaign, ordered his, at that time, commanded a brigade to attack where he shouldn't have and lost troops needlessly. For reasons that are not easy to understand, Burnside didn't know about this and thought he was a reliable commander, so he was promoted to be the commander of the 1st Division of the 9th Corps. And his staff members apparently tried to hide the worst from their superiors about him out of a misguided sense of loyalty to him. Now, Ledley did not lead his troops. He stayed in the Union line and told them to go forward. He did take refuge in a bomb proof. He did ask the surgeon in that bomb proof to give him something to steady his nerves, so he got some rum to drink. No evidence, however, that Ledley was incapacitated on July 30th or inebriated. There's no doubt that he was skulking in the rear, but there's no evidence that he was drunk. My argument is, however, that if you have someone who's incompetent, who takes drink too much, it's probably better in an attack for him to stay in the rear anyway and not be up in front and giving orders. So in that sense, he might have helped the Union cause by staying in that bomb proof and <laughs> sipping a rum now and then, rather than by going up into the breach to try to tell people what to do because he wouldn't have been effective at that anyway. Ledley had two very good brigade commanders under him, and if they had been given the right orders, they would have had a good chance of doing what they were supposed to do, but Ledley had not given them the right orders. So Ledley's culpability is very high for the failure of the attack, but not because he was drinking in a bomb proof, but because the night before he made a terrible mistake. And whether he was drunk in, and, because, and made that mistake on the night of July 29th, we don't know. We don't have evidence of that.